Another blow to Catholic schools already struggling to stay open through the pandemic. I'm Jessica Easthope with what they're saying about being left out of a crucial aid bill. Plus, will COVID restrictions on some churches in red zones be lifted? The pain from unemployment because of coronavirus is being felt hard in parts of the Brooklyn Diocese. And coping with the pressures of the pandemic, some pro advice for helping kids navigate these unprecedented times. The news starts right now. Good evening, I'm Christine Persichetti. House Speaker Nancy Pelosi says today is the deadline for a COVID relief deal. If an agreement can't be reached today, there will be no coronavirus relief bill before Election Day. Talks between the House Speaker and Treasury Secretary Steve Mnuchin are ongoing. The deal is said to be close to $2 trillion, although there are reportedly a number of policy differences that remain unsolved. One thing not included in the proposed second stimulus package, aid for private schools. The U.S. Conference of Catholic Bishops condemns that, saying the pandemic affects all Americans, including families with children in Catholic schools. Current News' Jessica Easthope spoke with parents and the principal at Bay Ridge Catholic Academy. Good morning, how are you? Students file in to Bay Ridge Catholic Academy, but before they can enter their classrooms, temperature checks here yeah. and here. Normal temperature. And when they get there, on all of their desks and the walls of every classroom, hand sanitizer. The precautions the school is taking to make sure its in-person model is safe and successful come with a price tag. The superficial cost of the pandemic for PPE ranges into the tens of thousands probably, and the larger costs associated with the smaller class sizes that we've agreed to partner with the state on Losses can total into the hundreds of thousands. Bay Ridge Catholic Academy is among the tens of thousands of Catholic and other non-public schools left out of the HEROES Act. The proposed legislation would allocate $182 billion of pandemic relief for K-12 through public schools only. The fact that we were not included is terribly disrespectful. We proved that instruction can occur daily safely. This is the latest blow to American Catholic education. 150 Catholic schools closed for good this year. 26 were in New York City. They spent millions of dollars, as you know, to to get ready to reopen and we reopened really successfully and they've had no outbreaks. Why? Because they spent money on disinfecting and social distancing and rearranging things. The U.S. Conference of Catholic Bishops Committee on Catholic Education released a statement about the HEROES Act, saying, quote, it is unconscionable that the latest aid proposal would exclude these American children and the schools they attend from emergency aid that would ease the financial burdens they have borne as a result of the pandemic. These are blue collar parents and the first responders, and yet the House Democrats are really turning their back on them, and it's really such a shame. Bay Ridge Catholic Academy parents say the current proposal for the HEROES Act is unfair. They're doing a great job keeping us open while the public schools are going hybrid or remote, and they're getting the funding. It's important that the schools are open. And to do that, we need funding, and any funding we can get would be a great help. Negotiations over the HEROES Act are ongoing. The U.S. Conference of Catholic Bishops has requested 10 percent of what's being afforded to public schools be given to non-public schools. In Bay Ridge, Jessica Easthope, Currents News. Tonight, the Diocese of Brooklyn is holding a major fundraising effort to make sure families can keep their kids in Catholic schools. The Futures in Education Gala helps to raise money for scholarships, something especially needed during the pandemic. Monsignor Jamie Gigantiello, the Director of Parish Giving and Vicar for Development in the Brooklyn Diocese, previewed the event right here on Currents. I mean, if anyone went to the uh, event last year, the highlight of the event, of course, was when Monsignor Casado and I, myself uh, got up to sing Sweet Caroline, <laughs> and we got the whole place singing. And people nice. left there saying, this was the best <laughs> fundraiser we ever go to. And Rosanna Scotto, who will be our host again, yeah. uh, she always talks about it and she loves it. So I think we'll have a little rendition uh, during the show. Uh, Monsignor Casado and I will be on the show leading it. Uh, so it, it's going to be a, a great event. 
The event is broadcasting live right now. You can watch it on futuresineducation.org. That's where you can also find information on how to donate to the organization. And you can tune in tomorrow here on Net TV. We'll show the event in full after tomorrow's newscast at 7.30. There's a back and forth between New York Governor Andrew Cuomo and Mayor Bill de Blasio on reopening restricted places in COVID hot zones. While Governor Cuomo says that COVID restrictions in red zones could be lifted this Wednesday, Mayor de Blasio is countering that it could take weeks. We'll know on Wednesday the outcome. But Mayor de Blasio is saying that school testing is showing positive results. Only 28 students and staff have tested positive in our entire school system after more than 16,000 test results have come back. That is a positivity rate of 0.17%. This is really extraordinary. Mayor de Blasio is asking parents to this continue testing efforts to keep up year, those good results. The confusion caused by the pandemic could lead to mental health issues for kids. Coming up later in this newscast, Dr. Kate Walsh Souchere, a licensed marriage and family therapist, will tell us what we can do to help our children through these tough times. That's still ahead in this newscast. Mayor de Blasio also updated New Yorkers on the COVID death rate in the city, another source of good news. But what's been extremely striking, and thank God, that the number of deaths has not been increasing uh, markedly. And, you know, we're dealing with something very different here, obviously, than we dealt with in March and April. A health expert further confirmed that New York COVID deaths are not going up, and they haven't for, quote, several weeks and several months. Across New York City, unemployment remains high. Over 39,000 people filed first-time claims last week, up slightly from the week before. People here in the Diocese of Brooklyn have been particularly hard hit. Current News' Emily Druby has more from Richmond Hill. Many New Yorkers are still struggling, especially when it comes to stable work. Across the state, unemployment rates are high. The biggest numbers coming from the Bronx, Brooklyn and Queens. The lingering unemployment woes coming as a surprise to many, including Queens resident Reggie Ranjit. I didn't think it was going to last this long. Before the pandemic, the parishioner of Holy Child Jesus Church in Richmond Hill worked in IT, technology for restaurants, a field he thought was stable. Uh, restaurant POSs, you'd think that they'd always be needed, but with the current situation of everything, you know, restaurants can't afford to stay open. He was furloughed back in April using unemployment to get by, but there was always hope until the beginning of this month. Uh, on October 5th, they finally terminated me due to the uh, global position of how the restaurant business is running. Many restaurants are still struggling. In fact, 63% of them in New York say they'll close by the end of the year without state or federal help. Reggie's job a casualty of this statewide struggle, leaving him feeling unstable. A little bit nervous, a little bit scared, you know, keeping up with the rent and all the other bills and expenses and things like that. The devout Catholic has used his faith as a rock, taking this time off to help his church with technology repairs, grow his business, a computer and technology repair company with a YouTube channel, What's up everyone? Reggie Tech here. I hope and work and home repairs, all while continuing to look for a job. Reggie is just one example of so many who are still struggling to find stable and well-paying employment. In the city, the recent weekly unemployment numbers are still six to 11 times higher than they were last year. <laughs> Food pantries in New York City are also still seeing long lines with an estimated 1.5 million unable to afford food. Reggie has a message for everyone who is struggling. Don't let it bring you down. It gets tough sometimes, you know, things get rough, but you really got to look for that and have the faith that there is going to be a better day next, you know. In Richmond Hill, Queens, Emily Druby, Currents News. Yet another statue of the Blessed Virgin Mary has been vandalized at a Catholic church in Brooklyn. This incident happening at Resurrection Parish in Gerritsen Beach. It's not known how it happened or who did it, but their statue of Mary was found with one hand missing, the other hand broken, and a crack in her face. The NYPD Hate Crimes Task Force is investigating. 
It was a day of firsts for Pope Francis, the Holy Father, attending his first public event in Rome Tuesday. It was also the first time the Holy Father extensively used a face mask, wearing the white cloth during most of the interreligious prayer ceremony. The pontiff previously only wore his mask for brief periods of time, like when he's driven to his weekly audiences, but has removed the mask before those events. During the service, the religious leaders prayed for world peace. There's a lot more news headed your way. The pandemic is taking a toll on everyone, especially the youngest among us. Expert help is ahead to guide us through these unprecedented times. Plus, election 2020, there's record early voting and new debate rules. And an experimental COVID-19 vaccine being rolled out in China. Now you can help us put your faith in the news. The next time you capture a newsworthy event, send us your pictures or video. It's easy. Go to netny.tv slash send us and you may see your submission on Currents News. New York City's kids are caught in the middle as pandemic numbers continue to rise and fall. Schools are opening and closing left and right. The back and forth can confuse kids and take a toll on their mental health. Dr. Kate Walsh Soussure is a licensed marriage and family therapist and is on the board of the Catholic Psychotherapy Association. She joins us now to tell us what we can do to help our children through these tough times. And doctor, the pandemic has created a very confusing time for our kids. They're either in hybrid learning, they're remote, they're in school and as the cases surge, all of that changes and their schedules get changed. Can all of this possibly cause emotional trauma and even learning curves for our children? Oh yes, absolutely, absolutely, Christine. And the thing is, is that I think that many parents fear that there will be learning gaps and that the fear of those learning gaps actually increases anxiety in the parents, which then translates to the kids. So what are some tips to help children deal with maybe depression or isolation during this time? Okay, well, one of the first things and most important is to remember that we all have personal resources that we can lean on and turn to. And so to first of all, identify those resources and then use them. And I will just tell you this, that's never money. Money is never one of those resources. It's people people who love us, our faith community, teachers who care about us. Uh, secondly, um, we may decide that we, we forgot to breathe today, that we forgot to take a big, deep breath, because breathing will help interrupt the process of fear that is running through our bodies. And then thirdly, uh, to think about positive thoughts. And when we think positive thoughts, we're also releasing more positive chemicals in our brain and in our body. And the last um, idea that I would suggest is if families have pets, have those children spend time with the pets, cuddle with a cat, uh, spend time walking the dog, go out and play with your dog, throw a ball around, laugh, help children laugh. Oh, and I'm sure they would love that. Are there any cues that parents can pick up on with their children to identify if they are suffering? The first one will be to watch for children being grabby, um, irritable, more so than less than normal, uh, that they might uh, be less tolerant. They might be more prone to bite someone's head off rather than to take a breath, um, that they're also isolating more in their room. They're not eating regular meals. They're not, they're not sleeping as well. Um, if they're waking up with some bad dreams, uh, just, um, and they're just confused. They're feeling like they can't get their feet on the ground. Watch for those signs. Mm -hmm. And you have some homework for our parents at home, this worksheet that you put together um, to kind of gauge how your child is doing through yeah. all of this. So tell us a little bit about this. What, what are you looking for with this? Especially right now, children very much feel like they're on a roller coaster. And if we can remember that Jesus is with us, buckled into the seat with us, we're not in this by ourselves. And that if we can remember that he is our presence and that we are called to have right relationship, we're called to have good relationships with others in our families. And probably most importantly, to remember to learn to regulate our emotions, not to eliminate them, but to regulate them. 
we are going to learn so much from this time regarding resiliency. And that comes from regulating emotions. That's great. Okay. And of course, we will tell all our parents well, in a moment how you can get your hands on these sheets. Dr. Kate Walsh, Suchere, licensed marriage and family therapist. Thanks so much for being with us. Thank you. Have a wonderful day. God bless you. Bye. If you would like a copy of Dr. Kate's worksheet, head on over to CurrentsNY.tv. Just click on the link to this interview and we will have that worksheet available there. Now to election 2020, we're in the home stretch with just two weeks left to go before election day and early voting is happening at a record pace. More than 28 million Americans have already cast their ballots. John Lawrence has more. Election day 2020 is just two weeks away. We're going to win. I wouldn't have said that three weeks ago. I promise you. I'll work as hard for those who don't support me as those who did. More than 28 million Americans have cast their ballots early. Democracy isn't a spectator sport. It's not for bleacher bums. You got to get involved. So uh, that's why I, I, I'm here and uh, so I'm going to do my uh, democratic duty. You know, if you're not going to vote, don't complain for the next four years. That's the way I look at it. Over the next 14 days, voters will decide whether to have another term with the Trump administration. With your continued support every day between now and November 3rd, we're going to have a great victory. Or start a new era with a Biden White House. Justice is on the ballot in 2020. Economic justice is on the ballot in 2020. Climate justice is on the ballot in 2020. Trump and Biden are scheduled to debate for the second and final time this Thursday. The Commission on the Presidential Debates announced microphones will be muted to prevent interruptions. He has never I've offered a plan. It to I'm John Lawrence reporting. More Catholics who are likely to vote support Amy Coney Barrett's nomination as a Supreme Court justice by a 20 percent margin over those who don't. That's the finding of a new poll by Real Clear Opinion Research and EWTN News. 46 percent of Catholics approve of Barrett's nomination, 28 percent don't, and 27 percent have no opinion. It was split along political lines. 77% of Republicans are in favor of the conservative Catholic, while only 24% of Catholic Democrats support Barrett and 46% oppose. Meanwhile, the Judiciary Committee is expected to convene this Thursday to vote to advance the nomination of Amy Coney Barrett to the full Senate. Senate Majority Leader Mitch McConnell has said he would hold a floor vote next Monday, but Democrats could try to block that by demanding a quorum of senators be present for the vote and then not having a quorum present. If confirmed, Barrett would be sworn in at a ceremony that would be held immediately after the vote. That private ceremony would be led by Chief Justice John Roberts. In Chile, violent demonstrations that scorched two churches in the capital city turned deadly. At least one person died in clashes between protesters and police in Santiago. Hooded protesters set two churches on fire, St. Francis Borgia Church and the Church of the Assumption of the Blessed Virgin Mary. Both were heavily damaged. The Archbishop of Santiago of Chile condemned the arson and called on Catholics to carry out acts of reparation for the violence. The attacks came as demonstrators marked the one-year anniversary of deadly anti-government protests. In France, 15 people are being questioned in connection with the beheading of a teacher near Paris. Among those in custody, family members of the suspect shot and killed by police after the brutal attack. The teacher was murdered after showing his class caricatures of Muhammad during a lesson on freedom of expression. Police are also talking to some of his students who may have helped the killer identify the teacher. People in France are turning to Father Jacques Hamel, the priest murdered by Islamic terrorists in 2016. Religious leaders from different faiths gathered at his memorial in a suburb of Paris to pray following the latest attack. There they also laid a wreath for the murdered teacher and observed a moment of silence. Still to come on Currents News, an experimental COVID-19 vaccine is being rolled out in a big way in China. And Father Michael McGivney, who founded the Knights of Columbus, will soon be beatified. Do you have a story idea or want to share a tip? Email us at newstips at desalesmedia.org or call our 24-hour number 718-517-3122. We'll be right back.
It's all about supply and demand. And in China, the supply of an experimental COVID-19 vaccine isn't enough to meet the demand. David Culver has the story. They arrived early from all over China. Folks lured to the international manufacturing hub of Iwu City, specifically to this small community hospital. This is one of the first public locations where China's rolled out an experimental COVID-19 vaccine. They began injecting people over the weekend. The cost, about 60 US dollars for two doses. Word spread quickly. Some showed up Monday thinking they'd get a shot. Annie Koo among them. Es algo tan importante para ti, this no? is something really important to you, isn't it? I asked her. Yes, she replied, adding, because well, if you have the vaccine, it's much safer to leave the country. For more than 20 years, Ku's worked in import-export in Chile and returned home to China amidst the outbreak. She flew to Iwu the night before we met her. It's a two-hour flight from her home in southern China, eager and admittedly a bit desperate for immunity. And so they told you they don't have any and so you have to go find another place. Local officials later announced this distribution was only for those with specific foreign travel needs and pre-approval. Who was not the only one disappointed. Notice the groups of people waiting around the hospital parking lot. Some of them traveled in from neighboring provinces wanting the vaccine. As you kind of go through this main entrance here, we do know folks are going in to inquire about how they might be part of this trial, essentially. Because you got to remember, this is part of the emergency approval use granted by the Chinese government. This is not an actual release of an approved drug as of yet. China has been trying to push past the early allegations of mishandling, cover-ups, and silencing of whistleblowers surrounding the initial outbreak in Wuhan. And instead, officials here have highlighted their swift and seemingly successful responses to many cluster outbreaks. The most recent, in Qingdao last week, following a major travel holiday. After only a handful of confirmed cases surfaced, health officials began strict contact tracing and tested more than 10 million people in less than a week. And life, it seems, quickly returned to near normal again. But that's mostly within China, a bubble of sorts. For some whose livelihood is rooted in other parts of the world, where cases are surging once again, their only hope may be the vaccine. Annie Ku and the others now on to the next location to track one down. David Culver's Iwu, China. Meanwhile, in England, they're purposely infecting people with the coronavirus, this after injecting them with a potential vaccine. The United Kingdom is launching the first human challenge studies for the coronavirus. It involves giving healthy people a potential vaccine, then later testing it by deliberately dosing them with the virus. Tens of thousands of volunteers are willing to take part in the potentially risky research. In Italy, more than 41,000 have visited the tomb of the first millennial on the path to sainthood. Each day of the 19-day celebration of blessed Carlo Acutis's beatification, more than 2,000 people viewed his body in a church in Assisi. Acutis died in 2006 at the age of 15. The Italian teen built websites to inform others about Eucharistic miracles. And finally tonight, the founder of the Knights of Columbus will soon be beatified. Father Michael McGivney's beatification will take place on October 31st during a mass in Hartford, Connecticut, which will be celebrated by Cardinal Joseph Tobin of Newark. He will then be the first U.S. parish priest to be beatified and will be given the title blessed. Father McGivney founded the Knights in 1882. And that is Currents News. I'm Christine Persichetti. Thank you for joining us because we are putting your faith in the news. Hope to see you again next time.